اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين عليه الصلاة والسلام. Again, we begin the program tonight, the 21st uh, day, and now entering the 22nd night, we commemorated the anniversary of the martyrdom of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wassalam. And what we'll do tonight, inshallah, we'll continue uh, letter number 31 that we were discussing from Nahj al where the Imam is addressing his son and addressing the greater Islamic community of Muslim Ummah uh, with advice that he feels like should be heard uh, before uh, he is to pass. So uh, we concluded the uh, first section last night, which was an introduction of how the Imam is characterizing himself as the person who's writing this letter and introducing the recipient of the letter as well. We went over a few of the clauses where the Holy Imam is characterizing uh, the Muslim community and specifically the younger generation. Uh, tonight we move on to section number two and inshallah section number three as well. Essentially in the next the paragraph the Imam is describing why he's writing this letter. Uh, and his intentions. So I'll read the Arabic and I'll translate and inshallah we'll move forward. أَمَّا بَعْدُ فَإِنَّا فِي مَا تَبَيَّنْتُ مِنْ إِدْبَارِ الدُّنْيَا عَنِّي وَجُمُوحِ الدَّهْرِ عَلَيَّا وَإِقْبَالِ الْآخِرَةِ إِلَيَّا And let it be known that what I have learned from this world, turning its back to me, turning away from me, and the onslaught of time over me, and the advancing of the next world towards me, مَا يَزَعُنِي عَنْ ذِكْرِ مَنْ سِوَاي all of these things are enough to prevent me from remembering anybody other than myself. And from thinking beyond myself. But when I confine myself to my own worries, my own concerns, leaving the worries of others aside, my intelligence, my rationality saved me and protected me from my desires. amri, And it clarified for me my affairs and led me to seriousness. And it led me to a seriousness where therein there was no trickery, no fool, no foolishness. And a truth which was not to be tarnished by falsehood. So the Imam initially right now before he's explaining why he's writing this letter, he's saying that the state of mind that I am in when I'm writing this letter right now is with all of the craziness that's happening in the world around me, with all of the problems that exist in the world, with all the problems and all the concerns that people have in their lives. When I put all of those aside now and I begin to think about myself, my own position, my own concerns, my own problems, I find that if I'm able to reflect inwardly, I'm able to clearly see what is it in my life that requires addressing. It's important for uh, us to remind ourselves of this, that we have personal problems, personal concerns, and we have communal problems, societal problems. And while both of them are necessary, both of them need to be addressed, and both of them are as important as one another, it's important not to forget the personal part now. Because we're always surrounded by other people, and we see the problems that they have, sometimes we forget ourselves. Again, it's not to say that we should not be altruistic, we should. But at the same time, the self should not be forgotten, because sometimes... We are so ready to help address and meet and solve the problems of other people, but we forget to think about ourselves. And that perhaps is the greatest of tragedies. So when I did, this th when I did all of this and I was able to uh, have some sort of introspection, this is the kind of realization that now I had. Once I did this and I began to think of my own problems, here I found you as my son, and we said as an ascension in the Muslim community, a part of myself. Rather, I found you my whole. To an extent now and to a degree now, that if anything was to befall you, it is as though it had befell me. And as if, as if, if death has now came to you, it is as though it has come to me. Consequently, your affairs meant to me what my own matters meant to me. فَكَتَبْتُ إِلَيْكَ كِتَابِ مُسْتَدْهِرًا بِهِ إِنْ أَنَا بَغِيتُ لَكْ أَوْ فَنِيتُ So I've written this piece of advice as an instrument for seeking help through it, whether I remain alive for you or whether I do not. So interestingly, the Imam is saying that once I reflected inwardly to look at what my own problems were, when I was able to identify what those were, through this realization of what my problems are, what my concerns are, what my priorities are, here I had an epiphany. 
that my problems, as they're important to me, your problems also become my problems as well. There's a delicacy here that is different now. When a person doesn't have that personal reflection, when they attend to the problems of others, and their intention is to try and solve the problems of others, because they don't have an acknowledgement of the self, the quality of the work that they put in to help solve other people's problems will also be lacking. Why? Because a person who hasn't understood what is important for himself and does not care for himself, how can they truly care for another person? This is a reality. Yes, we want to be helpful to other people. But the question every person should ask themselves is, how much have you helped yourself? And the person that you're trying to help should be asking you, how much have you helped yourself that now you want to come and help me? Again, as Muslims, like we said, we feel responsible to help the less fortunate, people who are being oppressed, people who need help. Yes, that's good. It's a, it's a religious tenant. It's a human tenant. But at the same time, the other party will probably ask, what qualification do you have to now come and meddle in the affairs of other people? It's, it's respectable, it's commendable that now you want to help, but before you allow yourself and put yourself in a position of authority, there should be an assessment of what is the state of your own affairs. Once you've proven that you've been able to care for yourself and your own, there should you allow yourself as a Muslim to then go and help other people. Now, we're not saying, we're not speaking in absolutes. It may take a lifetime for a person to reform themselves. That's not the point. The point is that the person should be conscious also for caring for themselves at least before, even in sequence, before they go about helping other people. If we want to succeed as a Muslim community when it comes to actually establishing justice, being an aid for the oppressed, to standing up and resisting the oppressor, we need to make sure that we are not oppressing ourselves like we said in night's best. And hence, only through this a reflection can a person look at his brother and his sister as a part of himself, as an extension of himself, and not someone else. They look at them as themselves. They look at them as their family, their brother, their sister, truly. And then they begin to act with them uh, the, the same way that they would with um, a blood relative, for example, on good terms. Okay, so this is section number two now. The Imam is saying, make sure that You've understood this, know where I'm coming from, but also you, when you want to put yourself in a position of helping others, make sure that you're conscious of this as well. Now, he begins to give his advice. The first thing the Imam instructs is what? Taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we've already spoken about taqwa. For you to be God conscious, my child, and also abide by the commands of God. And to... Fill your heart, to create your heart with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to hold firm onto the rope of God. What, what connection is more reliable, more firm than the connection between you and between Allah subhanahu wa with, with this condition that you take hold of, this rope. And the Holy Quran says, Yes, as a community, all together, but also individually, each one of you, individually make sure you hold firm to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's where the Imam starts. Taqwa, we spoke about this, like we said in previous programs, before arriving, uh, the respected Sayyid Ali spoke about this, and essentially we are all familiar uh, to an extent as what this taqwa is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the Holy Quran about the position of the taqwa in Surah Al-A'raf verse 26, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, Qad anzalna alaykum libasan yuwari sawatikum wa risha. We send down for you garments to cover your bareness, your nakedness, and for adornment. Wa libasu taqwa dalika khair. But yet the garment, the clothing, and the covering of taqwa, this is superior. Dalika min ayatillahi la'allakum yadhakkaroon. These are of the signs of Allah so that you may take admonition. Okay, so taqwa essentially means for a person to be protective over their religious responsibilities and be in control and in authority when it comes to his or her own desires. From Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salatu wasalam in Nahjul Balagha, Khutbah 16, Sermon 16. This is how he's describing or characterizing the nafs, the soul, the shahwa that we spoke about last night. Ala wa inna al-khataya khaylun shumusun humila alayha ahluha. 
Be careful, beware, that the sins, the transgressions, are like unruly horses on whom their riders have been placed. وَخُلِعَتْ لُجُمُهَا And their reins have been let loose. فَتَقَحَمَتْ بِهِمْ فِي النَّارِ now that the rider is sitting on the horse that's loose and the rein has been let loose as well, because the horse is in control, the horse will take the person and will jump into the hellfire as a result of being loose. Because the horse does whatever it wants. It can't distinguish between what is good and bad for the rider. What is taqwa then? Taqwa is when a person sits on a trained horse, a horse that's now been trained. And the riders have the reins of the horse in their hands. And hence the person who is in control of the horse now uses it as a, a, a means of transportation and, and directs it and orients it towards salvation, towards paradise. So that's one thing that we need to be uh, conscious of. That taqwa as an, uh, as an idea, although it's very commonly or very frequently described as being repressive, it's really not. All taqwa means is that as a Muslim, there are certain guidelines, there are certain principles, there are certain do's and don'ts. To abide by them, to be Muslim is to abide by them. If you want to be a practicing Muslim and achieve those things that Allah has promised, you, this is the way to do it. Taqwa essentially means to be conscious of that and try as best as you can to practice those in your daily lives. That's it. Then the Imam continues, Ahyi qalbaka bil maw'idha. Enliven your heart through admonition. And kill it by through zuhd or through renunciation. And energize it with firm belief. Enlighten it with wisdom. And humiliate it by recalling death. Okay, so the first statement, the first clause that the Imam brings. Enliven your heart through admonition. We have numerous ahadith and verses of the Holy Quran that speak. The heart of the believer, the heart of the human, is in a way that it can die. If it's not fed, if it's not cared for, it dies. Anything that's living, if it's not cared for, if it's not fed properly, if it's not protected, it'll die. And hence, the Ahlul Bayt tell us in Nahj al Balagh, and Amir al says, Inna hadihil qulub tamullu kama tamullul abdan. Know that these hearts also become exhausted, like the bodies become exhausted. When you use your body, when you push your body, when you exercise, the body becomes tired. You have to rest it. And once you give your body rest, it becomes refreshed. It's able to work again for you. But if your body is tired and you don't rest, what's going to happen? You're going to burn yourself out. Then you can't do anything. Then the very thought of doing anything now becomes too much for you. And you say, I can't do it. And hence, you have to rest. The heart is like that as well. We're taught that the heart also has uh, the, uh, 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 guidelines to care for it. How do we care for our hearts? Do we even know how to do that? So it says, when the heart becomes exhausted with different things, it's important to make sure you give it food, you give it energy, you enliven it again. How do you do that? فَابْتَغُوا لَهَا تَرَعَفَ الْحِكْمَةِ أَوْ الْحِكَامِ Enliven it with the beautiful sayings, with the maxims, with the encouragements, with the advices of the Ahlul Bayt from reading the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says, a sign of the believers when they read Quran, what happens? It increases their belief. What, when the disbeliever reads the Quran, what happens? It increases their disbelief. Okay, so when we read Quran, hopefully it's having this effect that it's increasing our belief. That when we read it, it actually means something. So the mo'adha means admonition, advice. Seek to enliven your heart through seeking advice. The sign of an arrogant person is a person who is not willing to listen to advice, to seek advice. To ask others to critique him or her. People who are of course qualified, but to ask, in your opinion, what do I need to do to better myself? A person who is humble will always be looking for an opportunity for another person to critique them. To give them admonition, to give them advice. And hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you want to encourage people to strengthen their religious nature, their religious energy, invite them towards doing good things through wisdom and through the best form of admonition. Not by force, 
Not by threatening them, yes. There has to be a balance. The Holy Prophet is both Bashir and Nadir. He's also a, a bringer of good news. Also, he warns people of a punishment that will come. But the Quran is saying that if you want to effectively help a person believe in their religion and practice their religion, give them good advice. And through that good advice, now they will actually become admonished and they will uh, take heed of that advice. Now, the styles of admonition that we have from a religious perspective are two kinds. Sometimes the person who is admonishing, the person who is giving advice is an outside person. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the Holy Quran is, is an admonisher. In Surah Yunus, verse 57, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ مَوْعِدَةٌ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ O mankind, certainly has come to you an advice from your Lord. وَشِفَاءٌ لِمَا فِي الصُّدُورِ فِي الصُّدُورِ And a cure for what is in the chest. وَهُدًا وَرَحْمًا لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And hence, the relationship we should have with the Qur'an is, the Qur'an is speaking from a position of giving advice. The Qur'an should be in a position of trying to critique ourself. And we should be reading the Qur'an to look for clues and signs of how we can better ourselves. Not reading it as stories. Why does the Qur'an bring stories? Not to give us a, a better understanding of what's going on in history. Although that is a part of it. Some of the verses actually say, we brought you the stories of prophets that were previously unavailable to you. Or they were distorted. That's fine as well. But the primary objective of the stories that are brought in the Holy Qur'an is for what? Is to admonish us, to give us advice. This was the person, this was the nation, this is what happened. This is what you should know about where they went wrong. And you as a person, you as a community should not make this mistake. This mistake should not be repeated. So number one, we have to ensure that we, first of all, we have a relationship seeking advice regularly. One channel is through the Holy Quran. That means if the relationship with the Holy Quran has been severed, this is the month that you're supposed to reconnect. Reconnect meaning how? Reconnect meaning at, at least on a daily basis you have some interaction with the Quran. On a daily basis. It's not too much to ask. I don't know why as... For whatever reason, as Muslims, this is how we were taught our Islam, that it, it's, too, it's so much to ask. They say the Qur'an is like a friend to the believer. The Qur'an is a friend, so what does a friend want to do? The friend wants to interact with one another. So the Qur'an keeps coming and saying, do you have time for me? Do you have time for me? Do you have time for me? He keeps saying, no, I'm busy, no, I'm busy, no, I'm busy. What do you think is going to happen? We're bad friends. And though the Qur'an will be persistent because it wants to extend its friendship to us, it wants to perform the duties of a, a good friend, but sometimes we're very abusive, we're dismissive. No, I don't have time for you. When we don't have time for the Qur'an, what happens? Essentially, we're saying we don't have time to better ourselves, to reform ourselves. Go away, I have more important things to do. So first is to read. Make sure that we have this surface interaction. Make sure at least we have some face time with the Qur'an. Like we do with people that we are, uh, have acquaintances with or are friends of. You can't have a good friendship with a person you don't have any face time with. After you have some face time, you've established that face time on a regular basis, Make sure when you read the Qur'an, you're reflecting on what you're reading. If you're reading the Arabic and you understand the Arabic, make sure you pause to think about what's being read. If you don't know the Arabic, make sure if you do read the Arabic, because it does have blessing, that you read the translation as well. A person like me may go a lifetime of reading the Qur'an in Arabic and never read the translation. Or if I have read the translation, I can't remember anything of it. Again, look, compare the relationship we have with the Qur'an like the relationship you have with a friend. If a friend you have, you've seen them a hundred times, you don't even know what his name is, what does that mean? He's your terrible friend, your terrible person, or you have a terrible memory. If you see him over and over and over, but you can't remember anything about him or about her, what does that mean? You're not paying attention. Sometimes that's the kind of attitude we have. People are speaking to us, what do we do? Either our mind is somewhere else, or that rude to even like, not even pay attention to the person when they're speaking to us. So the Qur'an sometimes has this, this criticism as well. Qur'an complains. Qur'an says, I'm here to be friends with people, to be friends with the believers, and this is the kind of attitude they have towards me. First, they put me somewhere that's hard to reach. They only see me in times of either when someone dies or someone is getting married, right? These are some, some of the relationships we have with people, that's all we see. We see them at a funeral or we see them at a wedding. Oh, hey, how are you doing? You know, like, okay, I haven't seen you in a long time. Everything good? Yeah, good. Okay, we'll see you next time. You can't expect to reach out to that person in a time of need. You can't expect that person to come and tell you something about your character. Imagine a person you saw only at these sort of functions then comes and tells you, you know, I noticed that, for example, you said something that's improper. Only a person that you feel comfortable with will come and tell you that. Brother came and told me tonight. Something said last night was 
unbecoming. Well, it's because I didn't know what it meant. But he will only allow himself to say that. Why? Because he feels comfortable with me. No other person will come and say that. Why? Because they feel uncomfortable. So the Quran now says, I want you to read me. I want to speak to you. How? I feel like these are important things for you to hear and reflect on. And this can help change you. But the Quran is only going to come and say those things when a person has established a good relationship with the Quran. Otherwise, the Quran says, fine, come and read me, exchange pleasantries, that's fine. You were abusive to me. And on the day where you now need a friend, the day of judgment, I'm not going to be there. I'm not going to be there as a friend for you. So first read, FaceTime. Reflect on what's being said. Inquire. Essentially, you're asking the Quran, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? The Quran said, well, this is what's going on. This is what I know. These are the experiences that I have. And finally, after you, you've heard those things, you reflect it and act on it. It means you're listening. If a friend asks you to do something, you don't do it, that means you're not listening. If they try, if they try and give you advice to better yourself, you don't do it, that means you're not listening or you're too arrogant to listen. And hence, uh, uh, the Holy Imam says, first thing, enliven your heart through admonition. The main source of admonition has to come through the Holy Quran, number one. So, if we have other sources of, of admonishment, which, for example, are in the, in the, the form of the Ahlul Bayt, which they absolutely are, the Holy Prophet absolutely is, or even scholars, preachers, programs like these. There's a hierarchy, which means what? Any program that is established, that is meant to give advice, admonish, remind, a program of a gathering of reflection, a, a gathering of reform, if the Quran has little to no position there, that is a sign of a, a gathering, of a community, of a majlis, or whatever you want to call it, that it will probably not be very fruitful. So although the first thing, the most important thing, the most central thing, at the crux of everything that we do, the whole Quran should be there. And then that is complemented by the hadith, the sunnah. Then after, as an extension of that, now a preacher comes, a scholar comes, uh, an imam comes, whoever comes and helps just connect us with those things. So. That's number one then. The second thing to remember is if we want to help give advice to other people, because the Quran says, it teaches us that, should there not be a people who enjoin to the good and forbid to the evil? Yes, so we're responsible towards the character of one another. I don't have to ask, answer for your action, but I should feel a sense of responsibility. That's what the Imam is saying. The Imam is saying when I looked inwardly, I saw that you were a part of me, you were an extension of me, you are me. Your problem is my problem. Your character flaw is my character flaw. As a community, the character flaw of a community member is reflective of the character flaw of the whole community. Now we're going to go through some of the conditions that are necessary to ensure that this admonition that's done is done correctly and within the bounds of Islamic teaching. Number one, if we want to share, we want to give advice, we want to help one another, we have to make sure it comes from a position of sincerity, of love, and it needs to be done accordingly, in accordance to the position, the age, the circumstances of that person's life. It needs to be sincere. So sometimes they say mawida, sometimes they say nasiha. Nasiha comes from what? Nus. Nus means what? Something that's pure, sincere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran says, Ya yuha ladina amanu, tubu ila Allah, tawbatan, nasuha. Means what? Repent to Allah, a sincere repentance, a pure repentance. So if we actually want to help another person, the first thing that needs to come to my mind is, why am I saying this? Am I saying this from a position of superiority? I'm better than the other person. This needs to be fixed. This is making me look bad. I don't want to look bad, so I have to go tell this person something. No. Lovingly. In the Holy Quran, when the prophets of Allah, the Messenger of Allah, the uh, men of God want to speak and give advice to other people, this is how they speak. We read in Surah Luqman today, in this Joseph that we're reading, in other places as well. In Surah Yusuf, when his father, Yaqub is trying to Explain to Yusuf. Says, "Qala ya bunayya." Bunayya means what? And he Arabs your son, but not only son. It's like almost a a, a a title of of love. My dear son, my beloved son. That's what it means. Ya ibni, my son, my kid. Ya bunayya. So it's coming with love. La taqsus ro'yaka ala ikhwatik. Don't tell your dream to your brothers. Fayakidu laka kaida, so that they may devise scheme against you. Inna shaitan al insan adum mubin. Surely uh, the shaitan is a manifest enemy to the human. So the first thing that we need to remember is, if we want to advise others, make sure that it's come from the point of sincerity. Now, 
Probably in most of our minds, the first thing we're thinking is my brother in religion, my sister in religion, right? So my brother has a fault, I'm, I, I, I've noticed it, I've observed it, and I want to say something. No, the first position is where? First to yourself and then to your near ones. That means your family. That's where it should begin. So, as a parent to a child, again, we need to ensure that when we are advising them, and we should be advising, we shouldn't be telling them, we're advising them, advising comes from a position of love. And make sure they understand it comes from a position of love. The language that we use should also be reflective of that love as well. That's what the Quran is teaching us. So the Quran says, Ya Bunaya, Ya Bunaya, Ya Bunaya, Ya Bunaya. It's not saying, do this, do this, do this, do this. I'm in charge, you're not in charge. You do have to do whatever I say. So long as you live in my house, this is how you have to act. It's not Quranic teaching. Of course your child's not going to want to do that. What is the natural response of your child going to be? If that's the case, once I come of age and I leave your house, then I'm going to live based on my rules. So congratulations, parent of the year award, because you got your kid not to do anything that is not pleasing to you in your presence. Round of applause. Many of the Muslim communities this is how we parent. Don't do it in front of me. Let, make sure I don't see you do that. What, what, what does that mean? Allah is seeing, others are seeing. It doesn't matter if you see it or not. So love. Number two, if we want to give advice, don't do it like the way that I'm doing now. Be short and sweet. Usually being short and to the point is a lot better. Why? Because either people's attention spans are not that much or because you can, you can say what you need to say in a couple of words. The story of a great scholar, Sheikh Jafar Shushtari. A lot of people came to him. A lot of delegates, government delegates came to him because he was a, a, a man of God. And he would give sometimes these sessions on advice and admonitions. Okay, we're here now. Tell us, what should we do? I'm going to tell you one statement. Just remember, wherever you are, God is watching. That's it. That's it. If a person understands that, nothing else needs to be said. You believe in God? You believe in responsibility of your actions? Okay, know that God is watching you wherever you are. That's it. Done. If you can remember that, that's the key to your salvation. Nothing else, you need to be told nothing else. Number three, we have to make sure that we're respectful to other people. Respectful. The story of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain, salam, right? They saw the old man, he was doing wudu, he was doing it wrong. What did they do? Oh my God, look at this old guy. He's like, uh, lifetime as a Muslim, does he know how to make wudu? Okay, sometimes we go to masjids, we see people that are praying wrong. What? Are, Brother, oh my God, your prayers are all void. Allah is not going to accept from you. Go do repentance. Well, okay. What do they do? Smart, right? They told the old man, observe the two of us. We want to have a competition, see which of us does it better. They both made wudus. They were both correct. And the old man understood the fault in his way and he thanks them. So being respectful is also very important as well. Whether the person is older than us or younger than us, it does not matter. Number three, which is very important. And we're almost done here. Respect the privacy of a person. Remember, if we're talking about advice, admonition, it generally means that you want to tell something to someone that they're not doing so well. Make sure that their privacy is respected. Nobody wants to hear about a problem that they have, a mistake that they've made in public. Not even in a family setting. A parent should also be conscious of that. If they want to teach their child something, unless it needs to be that all of the children have the same problem. Make sure you take your child aside and you speak to them. From uh, Amir al-Mu'minin, also Imam al-Askari, this has been narrated. Man sirran zanahu. A person who admonishes his brother in secrecy, in privacy, he's beautified him. شانه, a person who admonishes him or does that in public, in, the, in front of the, the eyes of other people, then he has disgraced him. He's tarnished his reputation. He's destroyed him. And he's dishonored him. So we have to make sure that this is done privately. Brother, you know, I've noticed this, 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 and that. I may be mistaken. This is how I understand it. If I can be of any help, Smindah. Usually, you, before that, you tell them a lot of good things that they're doing. And then you tell them about something that you observe. Just so they don't take it to heart. After that, make sure that there's some sort of patience. Consistency. Okay, people are not going to change overnight. If a person has a problem and it's a problem that's visible, it generally means that it's, it may be deeply rooted. So if you want to help a person better themselves with a problem, a habit that they have that's deeply rooted, it's going to take time. You tell a person one time, okay, well, they're not going to be perfect. You may have to repeat yourself or you may have to give them time. We have to be patient, specifically parents with our children. I told you once, okay, so what? Like, you must be higher than God because God is constantly repeating himself in the Quran. 
God is saying the way that I created you, forget. So I have to keep repeating you, repeating, repeating. فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعْتِ الذِّكْرَ فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ مَا أَنْتَ مُذَكِّرْ Tells the Prophet. Remind them. You're just a reminder. So telling once to the child and saying, you know, I t- remember I told you? Okay, so you tell him again. Tell him again. Tell him again. Be patient. Through time, through persistence, inshallah, uh, change can be made. But more important than all of these things, of it coming from a position of love, sincerity, of a person being respectful, to respect the privacy, to be patient. More important than all of these things, if a person wants to put themselves in a position of helping another person, like we said initially, we have to make sure that we don't forget ourselves. And that's where most of us forget things. We remember all of the misdoings of other people, but we forget all of the problems that we have, all of the mistakes that we have, usually because we're not even thinking about it. So I'm going to share two rawayat, two hadith, that speak of uh, this sort of an attitude, how if a person is not conscious of that, not only will it not help, it can be destructive as well. So the first is a story from uh, actually a very famous narrator of hadith by the name of Muhammad ibn Munkadir. And now he has an interaction with Imam Baghir alayhi salatu wasalam. So he states now, I'm going to read the Arabic as well because we have some time I think, right? Okay, we have time, okay. So this is found, the hadith is found in Al-Kafi, volume 5, page 73. And Abi Abdullah alayhi salatu wasalam, from Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam, from Imam Al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, Inna Muhammad ibn Munkadir, kana yaqul, ma kunt ara anna Ali ibn al-Husayn alayhi salam, yada'u khalafan afdalu min. I thought to myself, he's a scholar himself, he's living during the time of Imam Zainul al abidin and Imam Al-Baqir. Says, I thought to myself that Imam al uh, Imam uh, Zainul Abidin, Imam Sajjad alayhi salatu wasalam, there can be no one like him. He can never have a son that is similar to him, equal to him, like him. Hatta ra'aytu ibnahu Muhammad ibn Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. Until I saw his son, Muhammad ibn Ali, Imam al Baqir. So, fa'aratu an a'idahu. I made this intention to go and admonish him. Why? Because I saw him, he's telling the companions there. I saw him, I, was, I thought that right now. It's a good time for me to go on and admonish him. فَوَعَدَنِي I went to admonish him, he admonished me. فَقَالَ لَهُ أَصْحَابُهُ The companions that now he's narrating the story, he says, how so? بِأَيِّ شَيْءٍ وَعَذَكَ What did he admonish you to? قَالَ خَرَجْتُ إِلَى بَعْدِ النَّوَاحِ الْمَدِينَ فِي سَاعَةٍ حَارَةٍ So I went out to the outskirts of Medina, and it was very, very hot outside. Like today, I'm, I'm assuming for this area. 90 degrees, 100 degrees, very hot here, okay? It's burning, حَارَةٍ It's burning. فَلَقِيَنِي أَبُو جَعَفَرْ مُحَمَّدِ بْنَ عَلِيَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ So over there I saw that Imam Baghir was there. وَكَانَ رَجُلًا بَادِنًا ثَقِيلًا He is a young man, he's strong, well built, the way that we say. وَهُوَ مُتَّكِعُونَ عَلَى غُلَامَيْنَ أَسْوَدَيْنَ أَوْ مَوْلَيَيْنَ He's working with two workers now. فَقُلْتُ فِي نَفْسِ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ Now this narrator, Muhammad ibn al-Munkadir, he says, I thought to myself, Inside, Subhanallah, Shaykh min Ashyakh Quraysh fi hadhi al-Sa'a ala hadhi al-Hal. A Shaykh, Shaykh means a, an elder or a person of position, a person of stature, a person of stature from the tribe of Quraysh, a very prestigious tribe. At this hour, doing this, fi talab al-Dunya, he's uh, he's working towards achieving uh, the resources of the Dunya. Ama aida, ama aida huna. فَدَنَوْتُ مِنْهُ So I thought I should go and admonish him. What should I tell him? I should tell him that, what are you doing right now? It's so hot. It's not worth it for you to be out working right now. So I should tell him, like, you know, take a break. You shouldn't be working. It's, it's dangerous for your health. So I went and I did salam to him. فَسَلَّمْتُ عَلَيْهِ فَرَدَّ عَلَيَّ السَّلَامُ I said salam, he responded with his salam. وَهُوَ فَقُلْتُ أَسْلَحَكَ اللَّهِ شَيْخٌ مِنْ أَشَّاخِ غُرَيْشِ فِي هَذِي سَاعَ عَلَى هَذِي I'm surprised. I find you with such position, in such a state, in this, in, in this heat. He says that, what would you do now if your death came to you and you were doing this? What would you do then? If you died right now, you're working for the dunya and you died. How would you respond to God? جاءني وأنا في طاعة من طاعة الله عز وجل. Said if death came right now, death would receive me while I was practicing, while I was 
applying one of the requirements, one of the instructions of my Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَكُفَّ بِهَا نَفْسِي وَعِيَالِي عَنْكَ وَعَنِ النَّاسِ Because by doing this work, I allow myself to be independent from your help and the help of the other people. That means I can be independent. I don't need to beg. I don't need to ask other people for help. وَإِنَّمَا كُنْتُ أَخَافُ أَنْ لَوْ جَاءَنِ الْمَوْتِ وَأَنَا عَلَى مَعْسِيَةٍ مِنْ مَعَاسِ اللَّهِ What I do fear though that if death was to come and I was in a position that I was performing a sin, I was disobeying Allah. That's when I have fear. فَقُلْتُ صَدَقْتَ يَرْحَمُكَ اللَّهِ Then the narrator says, yes, you said correctly. May Allah bless you. أَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَعِذَكَ فَوَعَدْتَنِي I had the intention to come and admonish you and hence, but in response you admonished me. So that's number one. Sometimes we go to tell another person about something that's wrong with them, but in re- return, they turn and they admonish us. So we'll make sure that we're also conscious of that. And this last story, I'll end with this because I know our admonishments have gone way over tonight's uh, um, amount. And this is a story from Imam Zain al-Abadeen. More than anything, I think I'm just speaking to myself because it's speaking about a person in a position of an admonishment. And Zain al-Abadeen alayhi salatu wasalam marra bil Hassan al-Basri. Imam Zain al-Abadeen passed by a scholar by the name of Hassan al-Basri. وَهُوَ يَعِذُ النَّاسِ بِمِنَا People were sitting alongside him in Mina and he was advising them. فَوَقَفَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ عَلَيْهِ The Imam stopped, ثُمَّ قَالْ أَمْسِكْ Be quiet so I can ask a question. أَسْأَلَكَ عَنِ الْحَالِ الَّتِي أَنْتَ عَلَيْهَا مُقِيمٌ أَتَرْضَاهَا لِنَفْسِكَ فِي مَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ إِذَا نَزَلَ بِكَ غَدَا So can I ask you a question? You right now who's admonishing other people, are you happy with the state that you are right now in your life? Would you be satisfied and pleased to meet your Lord tomorrow like this? Qala la, no. Hassan Basri who was admonishing the people, he said, no, I'm not. I'm not happy with myself. Qala, afatuhadithu nafsaka bittahawwali wal intiqali anil hali allati la tarzaha li nafsika illa al hali allati tarzaha? Have you reflected? Have you thought to yourself? Have you spoken to yourself about trying to make a change? It means you're speaking to yourself now. Have you talked to yourself? Oh, I'm not happy with this. Have you spoken to yourself to try and make a change to yourself or not? It says, فَأَطْرَغَ مَلِيًّا قَالَ فَأَطْرَغَ مَلِيًّا ثُمَّ قَالْ إِنِّي أَقُولُ ذَلِكَ بِلَا حَقِيقَةٍ says that I've tried this many times of whatever I do. I keep on making sins. I keep on making the same mistakes. Anyways, long story short, I won't keep reading the Arabic because I can tell that right now it's, it's, it's important to wrap up. In any case, he says that, okay, if you are unhappy with your current state, okay, and now you're telling yourself that you need to make a change. And you don't believe that after this prophet has come, any other prophet will come, any other religion, any other guidance will come. And you know that after this life, there will be another life there that you'll be responsible for your actions. If that's the case, and you're unhappy with yourself, what right do you give yourself to now go and advise other people? This is what the Imam said. What right do you, what right do you give yourself to do that? And it's recorded... From that point onward, until Hassan al Basri he was not seen advising anybody else in, until his death. So this is also something that we need to remember as well. When we want to advise other people, make sure we don't forget ourselves. Most important is we begin to advise ourselves. And how does that advice happen? It's through an inner admonisher that we have. That the Rawayat, the Holy Quran, speaks of this inner admonisher. At the very least, we call this the state of the nafs, the nafs al-lawama, right? The self-reproaching nafs. That when a person is in a position... Of, of, of making a decision, choosing to disobey Allah or to obey Him, the nafs comes and says, it becomes critical, it starts to criticize. If the person makes a mistake, so why did I do this? So a person needs to be aware of that, conscious of that, feed that, listen to that, and make sure that uh, before looking to other people, a person is looking to advise himself, herself, admonish himself or herself, and then also look to exterior resources uh, of admonishment, inshallah, take heed from them, listen to them, uh, and, and don't say that these things don't apply to me. That's the, the biggest mistake a person can do. Well, you know, I don't have the problem that's being discussed. I don't have this issue. I don't have that issue. No, if we look close enough, we'll find that we are all riddled with problems and many problems. And if we actually start to try and resolve them, we can see that it'll take a lot longer and it's a lot harder than we once thought. We ask by the right of this night, and by the, the verses of the Holy Quran that we read and the letter of the Holy Imam that we read that inshallah we can uh, look to better ourselves, hear the advice that's given to us, hear the admonition that's given to us and more importantly build the inner admonisher inshallah so that we may 
uh, work towards uh, uh, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our actions, inshaAllah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.